So, uh, just a quick recap then of what we covered on Friday. We looked at deriving two, uh, several models, three models, in fact, the literal model, the Langenhoff model, and the Freundlich model for uh, relating the various concentrations that you can measure in the in the uh, absorption system. So we have two particular concentrations that we're interested in. One is the CA concentration, the concentration of the material in the liquid, um, and then or in the bulk phase, then the CAS, which is the concentration of the adsorbent, adsorbate on the adsorbent. So CAS concentration of the adsorbate on the adsorbent. So uh, if you look at the confusion of adsorbent, the similarity of the words adsorbate and adsorbent, sometimes we'll simply just refer to it as solute. So it's the concentration of the solute on the adsorbent. Uh, so you'll see that in some of the questions and in some of the textbooks on the cell, they'll simply refer to the adsorbate as the solute. Uh, so I will sometimes use those terms interchangeably just so sort of the clarity of the, of, of the words are clear. So essentially CA is then a concentration of the solute in the bulk or in the liquid phase or gas phase. And CAS is the concentration of that same solute on the solid adsorbent. So the Freundlich and Langer isotopes is two of the, the most common isotopes to relate those two concentrations. The linear isotope works very well at moderate concentrations. So even though a system globally may be modeled by the Langer isotope, at least in this initial region, or in, for the Freundlich isotope, for that initial region, a linear model will do just great. Okay, so many times the linear model works fine, but over a wider range of concentrations, we would need to use a, a more specific isotope. Uh, the Langer isotope makes some more intuitive sense because it essentially says that even though I go up and up and up and up in CA, I, there's diminishing returns. I cannot load my adsorbent up infinitely, which the Freundlich isotherm would tend to indicate that if you, if you took it out, it would just keep going up to infinity. Langer settles out and, and indicates a more realistic scenario. So that's what we covered last class, and then we went on to talk about this diagram um, in some detail. So I've redrawn it up here on the board because we'll be referring to it in today's problem quite a bit. So that's for reference over there. So you can either use this diagram up on the board and redraw it for yourself, or you could just use the ones in the slides. But essentially, we said we we're going to look at two complementary views of the same system. I've got my feet coming in at a certain concentration CAF up at the top. And I'm loading up my adsorbent, so that's CAS, and in my effluent, CA. My effluent easily measured. CAS, impossible to measure. So I cannot take a probe and measure at an exact point what CAS is, but CA, my effluent, is, is straightforward to measure for liquid or gases. So we'll take a look at a complementary uh, view here. The first set of illustrations on the left hand side are the profile against the length of the pack bed. The other on the right is the view over time. And essentially we showed what happens at the beginning of time at some arbitrary time theta then we looked at, we said we've got an established zone at the front of my bed which is being used. So this is my equilibrium zone. So this portion of my bed has been used up. That fraction of the length has been used up. Then I've got a mass transfer zone which is somewhat used and somewhat unused. Conceptually, you can say, well, about half of that is used and half of it is unused. It's a, it's a zone where some of the bed has been uh, used, but there's still capacity on that adsorbent to take up more solute. And then there's a fraction of the bed that's totally unused as yet. So this is at some time theta, some arbitrary time theta. Keep going, and you'll load up the bed to a point, theta substitute B, the break through time. So at theta B, I have loaded up some of my bed, I've still got a mass transfer zone, I've still got an unused portion out here that's still, I still actually have capacity at breakthrough. However, coming out at time theta B, so on my time axis, if I was looking at the system, I just start to detect in my effluent some of the solids. That's the moment I have to turn my bed off. 
my bed is now essentially being um, at capacity because I'm starting to detect some of this material when I effort it. For environmental reasons, or depending on the purpose of this bed, I really cannot keep going because if I do, I will start to see a rising concentration of solute in my effluent, which is going to then push me over to some environmental limit or over the specification that I have. But let's, uh, for illustration, keep going. There's a time theta s that we'll talk about a bit today, and then there's a final time theta e. At time theta e, essentially, your pack bed has just become a pipe. Whatever's going in, and your feed is coming out from your effluent. So coming out at at the end is essentially my outlet concentration. CAF is the same as my inlet concentration that I put in at the feed, feed side of the, the pack bed. So there's no more capacity for that absorber to take up solvent. Then we also, uh, you can visualize that mass transfer zone in, in, in this way. Here's essentially my used portion of the bed. My mass transfer zone is a part of it that's used and a part of it that's essentially unused. And then uh, this illustration is just at breakthrough time. If this was prior to break breakthrough, there'd be a, a section of the bed that's totally unused. So we're going to use those concepts. And in this next example, which goes over several slides, it's an example from G. Coppolis, if you want to uh, look at it a bit more um, in, in the book after today's class. But it's also an example to introduce a new theory. Uh, there's several new terms that get uh, introduced in this example. So let's take a look at the situation here. We have adsorbate in a vapor, solute in a vapor, and we're looking at taking that up in a packed bed. My limit 600 ppm, so that's on a mass per mass basis. We can only measure the outlet concentration of the time, and that's what the open circles are over here. So every open circle is a single measurement at a point in time of the outlet from my bed. That's easy to take. So I've run my bed over here for about seven hours, this experiment. The first three hours, I essentially measure nothing coming out of my effluent, and then I start to measure my typical S-shaped profile. The open circles then are those samples I've taken. And we've ratioed it though, and this is common to do, we ratio my y-axis so I'm taking my effluent concentration divided by my feed concentration. So then my y-axis becomes the scale from 0 to 1. That helps us then to interpret these integrated areas. This, an area A1, because my y-axis is a dimensionless number from 0 to 1, that integrated area A1 corresponds to a time. Because of my x-axis then is in time in hours. So the question, the first question asks here, uh, determine the breakthrough time of theta b. Effluent outputs at a higher concentration. 
The next question asks and, and introduces this concept of a wavefront and the concept of usable capacity. So at 3.65 hours, there is still some solute in the pack bed that's available to take up solute. Um, sorry, there's still adsorbent in the pack bed that's able to take up some of the solute. Let's talk about what an ideal wavefront is. An ideal wavefront is, we said last time, is if I could run my pack bed so that I had perfect pump plug flow with no forward and backward, or in other words, axial mixing, I can essentially have a perfectly vertical wavefront passing from left to right along the bed. But we get this dispersion, and that's due to diffusional effects in the, in the flow, we get a velocity profile building up in the bed. We're never able to get a perfect, uh, perfectly vertical wavefront. So we have this concept idealistically of, an, of this ideal, uh, this ideal wavefront, which is perfectly vertical. So we're saying, what is the usable capacity of the bed if I had that sort of wavefront? Well, if, if at time theta b I stop my bed, and if I really did have a perfect wavefront, I'm essentially stop my bed so that there's a lot of unused capacity. Essentially, this usable capacity is that area A1, the fraction of the total area. So just this, this region A1, corresponding to 3.65 hours, if I had a perfectly vertical wavefront, that's the fraction of the bed I would have used within 3.65 hours. But I've got, essentially, I could go up to 6.9 hours. Which, so essentially that ratio corresponds to 53%. So if, only, if I really could get this ideal case, which I could never get in practice, I would have used within 3.65 hours, I would have only used up to 53% of my capacity, leaving the other 47%. But let's go back then to, well, let me, let me explain that a bit more to help you uh, see why it's the, that why we can interpret areas as time. As I said before, because we've normalized my y-axis to 1, those areas under the curve correspond to time. So that's, that's the main reason why we can ratio these areas. There's a little bit of a pedantic issue that you sometimes see in some of the textbooks um, saying, well, really that's not the usable capacity. Um, because essentially I, that little piece of triangle over there, I really should have integrated that and that didn't. So <laughs> it, it's really not a, too much of a deal. Essentially just use it as 3.65 hours. So how long does it take to reach this capacity? Yes, it takes 3.65 hours. But if you had really accurate measurements, you could say it's, it's slightly different. But let's, let's just take a look here at the integral. That's the main concept you want to introduce. One minus CA over CAF. So in other words, I have plenty CA over CAF here on my, on my y-axis. So 1 minus that essentially corresponds to the area from the top down to this curve. So this S-shaped curve is CA over CAF. So 1 minus that corresponds to all that hatched area over there. So I'm integrating that hatched area between time 0 and 3.65 hours. So essentially saying I shouldn't really take that little triangle out of the place. Minor detail. Okay. So we'll call that time T used. And T used corresponds very closely to theta B, the break of time. And that's, that's very, very common in these experiments. T used is pretty much always equal to theta B. So that's an important note to add to your, to your notes here. Theta B, the breakthrough time, almost always corresponds exactly to T used. <coughs> That's the time taken to reach the usable capacity. <coughs> okay, so in purple there, that definition of the usable capacity corresponds to the time to reach theta B. Time to reach breakthrough. Ideal wavefront refers to this perfectly vertical wave that moves through the bed. Now, actually, one way people try to get ideal wave fronts, especially in liquid systems, is we've illustrated the system lying horizontally. But if you were running a liquid system and you pack your bed vertically, so you had a vertical bed, and you move your liquid very slowly from the bottom up through 
through there, you can approximate to a better extent an ideal wave flux. Obviously, a liquid system, you wouldn't run your pack bed horizontally because uh, you get more mixing. So if you run it vertically and you move, move up slowly, you can actually get quite close to an ideal wave flux forming. For gas systems, you, you have no, no ways to do that. Okay, so then we introduce this concept theta s. So theta s is, is called the stoichiometric capacity of the bed. And it says, well, let me recognize that at time theta b, let's, uh, let's take this illustration. This, 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 this green line here is drawn at time theta b. So at that point, I don't know what the future is coming here. All I've seen is no, almost nothing coming out of my effluent and then this, this small spike up. So at that point in time, this is the time axis, this is what my bed looks like, my length axis. So essentially, I've got a whole portion of my bed that's used up, and then I've got my mass transfer zone at the end, and then this S-shaped curve. At time theta b, this is the state of the bed. If I wait a little bit beyond time theta b, this green curve starts to shift, and then this green line moves, starts to move out the bed. So that's why I'm starting to see my solutes come out in the effort. So this is the portion that's used, but we could also conceptually say in my mass transfer zone, there's part of my bed that is used and part that's unused. Though really, that isn't true. I mean, this is, it is all used, but just used to, uh, it's not a fully loaded adsorbent. The, <coughs> the adsorbent there is partially used up. But conceptually, I can say, well, some fraction of this is used and some of it is unused. There's still some remaining capacity in there. And this, that's what the stoichiometric capacity says, that at the breakthrough time, essentially, it's not just this portion of the bed that's used. In other words, it's not just this region, A1, in the, in the previous illustration that was used. So here was A1, this was A2. Essentially, it's saying that at stoichiometric time, that region, A1 plus A2, is the actual capacity of the bed that's being taken up and, and being used. Okay. And so that's the stoichiometric capacity, is that area A1 plus A2. Let's go back to the previous slide and to see if, if, what I'm referring to there. So this is the region or time that corresponds to the, to the uh, equilibrium zone, and then there's this mass transfer zone, A, is what A2 corresponds to. If we add both of those up, that's the portion of the bed that has been used up. And theta s then is the time for that portion to be used. So one way to, to see it is simply to take your mass transfer zone, where you've got this sliding gradient, and simply divide it up in two. So we conceptually divide it up where we've got 50% of my area here and 50% of my area over there. I realize that I've drawn that green line a little too far. So to get it to about 50 50. So essentially, just draw a vertical line there, and time corresponds to a vertical line over there. That is the time theta s. So my mass transfer zone. Is a, is a region of the bed where I haven't quite yet used up everything of the adsorbent. There's a part that's used and a part that's unused. But if I took that entire section and if I allowed it to equilibrate, that's essentially where that word stoichiometric comes from. It's when you've taken that mass transfer region of the bed and you allow it to equilibrate, half of it would be essentially used and half unused. So theta s then um, corresponds to the time of the region A1 plus A2. So in this case, that's 3.65 hours plus 1.5 hours. That gets you 5.15 hours. So if you go back to this uh, original diagram, where did I get that 1.5 hours from? It corresponds to this region A2. And you could get that if you had to do it numerically by hand, uh, simply use your, uh, the trapezoidal rule and estimate that area using the trapezoidal rule where at using those white open circles. So those white open circles are my lab measurements that I've taken. I could use the trapezoidal rule and, S and sum up all those areas and I would get 1.5 as the area corresponding to A2. So 
So that's how you do it in assignments and so on. So area A1 plus A2 corresponds to 5.15 hours. The capacity used then of my bed is this ideal 3.65 divided by 5.15. I've used essentially 71% of my bed. Then the remaining fraction of my bed is saying, well, that part of the, there is a, a portion that's unused corresponds to this section over here. So this is the unused. It's sort of like a tail end of the bed that's, that's not used yet. Corresponding to the remaining 29%. So that tail end of the bed is unused. We always have to have, in packed bed systems, we suffer this issue. The moment when I turn my bed off, there's always this unused portion of my bed that I have to have. And that, that fraction of the bed is just something I have to deal with recognizing that it's because of I've got this S-shaped wave front coming through. I just have to live with adding on this extra piece to my bed when I design my, when I size my bed. So if I wanted to, we'll see this in, in the next question, if I wanted to make my bed run longer, I, would, I can simply make my bed longer, but that section that's always unused is always going to be the same length. As long as, long as I'm running at the same throughput, that unused section is always going to be the same length that I always just have to tack on to my calculations in order to size my pack bed. So that's what, uh, where, this, uh, where one of these next questions heads. But before we get there, let's actually calculate what that length of the bed is. If I say I did this in the lab originally and my bed was 14 centimeters long, what is that length of the unused bed at the breakthrough time, theta b? The moment I, I turn my, my pack bed off the B, intuitively you can simply say, well, that's 14 centimeters minus the uh, portion that you use. So conversely, you will say 29% times 14 centimeters. Either one of those will get you 4 centimeters of unused section. That's not to say that there is 4.1 centimeters of clean adsorbent sitting there at the end waiting. No, this is that, this is that kind of half-used adsorbent that's part of a partially used adsorbent. If you want a more specific formula for the unused section, it's uh, 1 minus the T used of the theta S, the stoichiometric time. Um, so there you can just ratio it against the area. So 1 minus 3.65 was the original area divided by 5.15 multiplied by the bed length of 14 centimeters to the same so either, either way uh, that you might be able to think about it. And we'll call that LUB, length of unused bed. So this is standard terminology you can see in all, in all these books. It's LUB and LES. That's the next acronym. Uh, LES plus LUB add up to the total bed length. So LES, it says it's the length of my equilibrium section. So if I was looking at my lengths here, it's essentially this is LES, and then this section over here is LUB. Both of those add up to get you your total bed length L total. Divided through by the original breakthrough, 3.65 hours, 
multiply that ratio now of, of desired versus original breakthrough times, multiply it by the length of bed that was used, which is 71% of the original 14 centimeters, or 9.9 centimeters. That says you need a bed of 20.4 centimeters. So essentially, my used portion originally was 9.9 hours. Now I, want to, I need to go to 20.4 centimeters. So it's simply a linear scaler of, of my bed. But then I have to recognize, well, there's also this unused bed portion that we need. That's the same from before. Simply take that tail end requirement of 4.1 centimeters and add that, those two on to each other and you get a total bed that's now required of 24.5 centimeters. And the reason why we can do that is because we keep the same diameter pipe and the same flow profile. If I alter either one of those, then, then I cannot simply take on that LUV, the length of unused bed from before, and simply add it back. Okay, so it's important that the diameter and the, and the geometry of the system and the flow or throughput in the system remain the same. We need to do that. Interestingly now, though, if I ran that system, I would see breakthrough um, where then my length of usable bed or LES length of equilibrium section would have been 20.4 centimeters divided by the original 24. So I've actually used slightly more capacity in my bed. So longer and longer beds end up fractionally using the greater portion of the bed. So what I'll do here for this question, if, if something seemed uncertain to you, please uh, check Gene Coppolis, this example uh, referenced up there. And also, there's an excellent article that talks a bit more about theta B, theta S, and theta E, and the relationships between these two curves on the left and right hand side. I'll post that article on the course website today, so that you can, uh, so you can read it. It's, it's a very well written article from the 1970s, and, and uh, I've made sure my notation that I've used here in my course notes corresponds to my post. Now, on Friday, we didn't get a chance to do our usual tutorial style questions on Friday, so I've got a, I've got a few questions here in the slides for, for us to work through in a minute. Just one final piece of theory that really will, will end off this section on adsorption before we move on to the next section. We have this relationship that we can calculate from a simple mass balance how much material is being loaded into the bed. So let's take a look at time theta b. I'm running my bed, and then at time theta b, the breakthrough time, I stop. Let's take everything that's happened up to time zero to theta b. Is we fed our flow coming into the path bed at some flow rate qf, meters cubed per minute per second. That flow is coming in at a constant concentration, caf. And I then run that between time zero and theta b. So for theta b minutes, I've been operating my bed with an incoming feed of caf at a flow of q qf. If I multiply those three together, I essentially get kilograms of solute, or kilograms of um, adsorbate, if you want, kilograms of adsorbate coming into the bed. So the product of those first three terms is total kilograms of solute again. Assuming that at time theta b, when I stop my bed, okay, so that's essentially here between time theta b, I've, I've operated my bed over this, over this duration, and then I've stopped. Assuming this value over here to be essentially zero, so in my effluent, I'm not seeing any, any effluent coming out. So this is important, this slide makes a critical assumption. It says that as long as between time zero and theta b, I'm not seeing any effluent coming out. It means that all that solute has loaded up onto the adsorbent. Okay, so this slide, please make an important note here. Uh, an important assumption is assuming none of your, F, your solute is leaving in the effluent. I should, I should have added that. So it's assuming no solute leaves in the effluent. And if that is true, that solute has been loaded up only on one place, which is the adsorbent. 
So the, the right hand side of this equation then characterizes that absorbent. We've got a bed of cross, a certain cross-sectional area A of total length L total. So that's the total volume of absorbent I've, I've used. So that's the last part of the bed, A of such that B. 1 minus uh, epsilon B. Epsilon B corresponds to the voidage of the bed. So essentially it says that I may have a certain volume on my bed, but only some fraction of that is actually occupied by the absorbent. 1 minus EB or epsilon B then gives me that volume fraction. So that term there is the total volume of adsorbent. Uh, rho S is then kilograms of adsorbent per meter cubed. And then CAS is the concentration of the solute on the adsorbent, which I cannot measure. Okay, so the only unknown I have in that equation is CAS. I can measure QF, CAF, my known feed, theta B is the time I stop my bed, and then the rest of it is bed geometry and, and adsorbent physical properties. But CAS I cannot measure. What I can do, however, is substitute the effluent concentration I measure, CA, coming out, and calculate what CAS is for my isotherm. So CAS I can obtain for my isotherm, where I relate my feed concentration, CAF, to CAS. So let's, let's take a look why, that's, why that can happen. Uh, on my isotherm, if we were operating on the Langmuir isotherm, in CAS, the concentration loaded up on the adsorbent, this axis over here is CA. In this case, I can find the point along this isotherm where I'm actually operating the bed. So let's say it's somewhere over here. That would be CA feed, my feed concentration. And then I can read off that corresponding value. It's, the reason why I can do that is because I'm feeding a certain concentration CAF to my bed all the time. And that's in equilibrium. In this used portion of the bed, for that period of time, it's in equilibrium with that adsorbent. So this adsorbent and adsorbate are in equilibrium with each other. The concentration in the bulk here over this used portion of the bed, because I'm feeding in from left to right, CAF is the concentration in the bulk, which is what that this axis normally corresponds to, is the bulk concentration. So essentially the, the, the pack bed is seeing CAF all the time in that used section and coming in equilibrium with it. So that's my x-axis value, read up, read across, and, and measure what CAS. So CAS is simply then calculated from the Langmuir isotherm, the Fonovic isotherm, the linear isotherm, corresponding to an x-axis value of CAF. So CAS is a function of CAF. Once I have CAS, I have kilograms of solute per kilograms of adsorbent. And if I know then how much material I've, I've fed into my bed, I can then calculate the volume or kilograms of adsorbent required to take up that amount of, of effort. Okay, so, so this is uh, a useful equation to then back calculate how much adsorbent I would require in a pack bed. And I can then use this to help me judge the size of the bed required. Okay, so what I'd like you to work on then is uh, this problem. I'll give you a few minutes to, to tackle this one. This is an easy one. This is from a midterm a few, few years ago, 2007, I think. The question is pretty straightforward. I'd like you just to just take a look at it and read it for a minute. And I'll go through it with you in about five minutes or so. It shouldn't, uh, you may not solve it all in five minutes, but I'd like you to think of it conceptually and, and how you would tackle the problem.
So batch systems are great to work with because if we run them for a long time and let them to go to infinity, it's very easy to do a mass balance over it. It's very easy to establish a boundary for it. There's a question coming up which is a continuous time system and that becomes a little hard. And so, uh, so if you, if this question is easy for you, you can move on to uh, the one, uh, two questions further on. There's a little bit more challenging on the continuous time system. Okay, so let's just take a look at, at one way to think about this problem. Um, this one conceptual way is to see it as we're doing a lab experiment first in order to determine the system's capability for the larger scale. So at the larger scale, we're going to use the same same material, the same contaminated material of 0.05 grams per liter. We're going to use that in the lab to establish our relationship between the solute's capacity to load up on the adsorbents and the remaining solutes that's left in solution. So batch scale terms are great for that because uh, we can, we've got good tracking of where our mass is going. So I'm putting in one liter of solution at 0.05 grams per liter. So my amount of solute in is 0.05 grams. So my lab scale, the 0.05 grams of contaminant that I'm dealing with. And three grams of adsorbents to take take that up. That adsorbent will take up some fraction and then the remaining fraction will be left in solution. And we're told here that 96% is used up and then the remaining 4% is going to be left in solution. So if you if you calculate those, it corresponds to 0 0.02, 0 0.02 grams in solution plus 0 0.048. That's taken up. Adsorbent. So that's a, from a mass balance. That's your, your 96 4 percent split over there. Now, let's just uh, 
a new line here, this is not just continuing on. That, that 0.002, what does that correspond to? Where does, which symbol does that correspond to? CA, CAS, CA, and then the amount of adsorbed is CAS. So what we can say then is in the lab system, 0.02 CA, CA is units of grams per liter, so it's the mass of solute divided by the volume of solute. So in this case, it's 0.002 grams divided by one liter. And then CAS is the amount adsorbed <coughs> that corresponds to 0.048 grams divided by 3 grams of adsorbent. In other words, 0.016 grams per gram. So in my lab system then, where we're told we can assume a linear isotherm relationship, I can establish that I had to plus CAS versus CA. It's a simple point out here that I have, and then straight line through. So I'm operating, my isotherm is, is, is a straight line, and I've got a single data point to establish an isotherm, and then the zero, zero point as well. So that relationship then is CAS is eight times C8. At the large scale, that same isotherm would hold. That's, that's the assumption here, and it's a reasonable assumption because we're using the same type of fluid um, from on the lab scale. We're just now going to take this up to a larger scale. We're still going to operate somewhere along the same isotherm, but at a different point. So as long as that assumption is valid, we're okay for the rest of the problem. If that's not valid, uh, we're going to establish a better isotherm. So assuming that same isotherm will uh, work over on the large scale, now we can look at the bigger scale, and we follow the same principle then. Solute <coughs> N is equal to solute in solution plus adsorbed. Except this time we've got a 99 and 1% split. We were asked on the larger scale to make sure that we achieve 99% of our contaminants being removed. Whereas previously I had a 4%, 96% split. Okay, so from here it's straightforward. Solute 10 is 400 liters times 0 0.005 grams per liter. And then I can get the split for the amount in solution versus not in solution. Further out, so this CA is at 0 
my lab scale is at 0 0.002. So I'm extrapolating that isotherm quite substantially out further along my x-axis. So we better, that's, that's why this is a key assumption. We better hope that that linearity still applies. I would be actually a little uncomfortable doing this. I would want to probably do a lab experiment also at, at, at some lower concentration at less using less adsorbent. So instead of three grams of adsorbent, I'd probably use half of that or less still and then make sure that that linearity still applies. But let's assume linearity applies. I can then extrapolate out further along this, this direction over here and, and establish what CAS is. So if CAS is 0 0.0004, then by a difference, oh, I do have a that's 19.8 grams. So if 0 0.004 corresponds to that 19.8 grams, that's 19.8 grams divided by S, S grams of adsorbent. So S in this case is 4.95 kilograms. So that's the mass of adsorbent that you need to take up that contaminant. And so I've actually answered question one and two in the opposite order. So there's my uh, part two one. So at the end of the process, what will be the concentration of the solution, the adsorber and the concentration of the adsorbent? Those are those two values and then the mass of adsorbent. Okay, so the remaining uh, the remaining questions that are in the notes have the answers. Um, or if your versions don't have the answers, they will have our posting on the website today. So these remaining questions over here have, have the answers. You can write those down if they're not in the notes just yet. I would strongly recommend you go through these. They will be also in the, in the next assignment anyway.